All you fellow grandparents, I know how hard it is to have grandchildren you aren't allowed to see or to spend time with. Little, little people who are carrying your DNA in them and who may even look like you and walk like you and talk like you, who are the logical heirs of your very being, both physically and emotionally. I probably don't need to tell you that your situation seems to be epidemic right now. I'm not sure why that is, but it's true. I'm an old man, and I don't remember ever hearing about this kind of family problem until a few years ago when it happened to my wife, Anne, and me. And she wrote a book about our experience called A Son is a Son Till He Gets a Wife, How Toxic Daughters-in-Law Destroy Families. She called it that because her mother, who was a wise old woman and full of aphorisms, always said that a son is a son till he gets a wife, a daughter's a daughter all of her life. She herself had four sons and two daughters. And in her experience, the daughters came home a lot more often and were much more reliable and supportive than the sons. I know that that book has hit a nerve with a lot of people and both Family Access, where you're hearing me right now, and an organization out of Florida called Alienated Grandparents Anonymous sprang out of it almost magically because it's such a common experience. We didn't know that until it happened. But now we know that there are thousands upon thousands of unhappy grandparents like ourselves who long to be with the offspring of their offspring, but can't usually because our own children's mates don't want us to be and have somehow poisoned the air between us. I'm on the board of AGA, Alienated Grandparents Anonymous, and I read all the emails Elaine Cobb sends out so faithfully. And I've spoken on this forum before, and I've had letters and phone calls and emails from many of you, and I know your heartbreaking stories. It's a terrible phenomenon of our time, and I wish we could say a magic word and make it all disappear, but it's obviously here to stay, and it has to be contended with case by case, situation by situation, often without a lot of success. If I myself want to cry or bellyache about not seeing my own grandchildren, three girls and a boy, for the past 15 years, tomb of two of whom I've never once seen. I think I can make a pretty good case for doing so. Here are some reasons. First, they don't live halfway across the country from me the way some grandchildren do from their grandparents. They live only 30 or 40 minutes away, depending on how heavy the traffic is. Second, my wife Anne became ill with colon cancer a few years into this standoff and I always believe it was the awful stress on her, her unrequited motherly love that caused her to develop the cancer. She was usually extremely healthy, had no unhealthy habits, and there was never any sign of this terrible affliction until she had to deal with the incredible frustration of not being able to see her own grandchildren. Third, my son and his wife refused all my pleas to them for a visit to his mother. And I asked them to bring the children with them. I believe with all my heart, this would have turned her health situation entirely around. Fourth, I'm almost through. When our son did finally phone his mother, she was dying. He only talked to her for five minutes. And Anne said she could hear our son's wife in the background telling him what to say or not to say. And fifth, when his mother died and I invited him to join his brother and me in a trip to her hometown in Kentucky where we would planned a life celebration at the community center for her family and old friends. His response was, I must decline. The kind of language he would never have used on his own without prompting from his wife. Wait, wait, there's one more thing. Our daughter-in-law's family was in a shambles. Her father and mother divorced, and he was living in Florida 
where he seemed to have a different girlfriend every few weeks, what my wife and I privately referred to as the bimbo of the month. A couple of years ago, out of the blue, I had a phone call from one of these women, one of the bimbos, who said she used to babysit for my grandchildren when they came to Florida to visit that grandfather. And she knew about my situation from that. On her second or third call, I asked her what my grandchildren were told as the reason that they could travel all the way to a distant state to visit that grandfather, but never saw my wife and me who lived only a few miles from them. Oh, that's easy, the woman said. They just tell them, you're evil. Now, I know that's awful, but I had to admire it for the clever response it was. Children have a certain respect for anything that is evil, and they probably wouldn't ask any more questions about it. Now, I've told you all of this to give you an idea of what my situation has been like, and then to go on to say, having my grandkids kept away as they have been has not been easy for me, but neither has it been the end of my world. It could have been if I had let it, but it wasn't. And those 15 years of privation, since I last saw the first two children, I continued to travel and speak to various audiences, usually to other ministers. For one year and there, I became the interim pastor of Norman Vincent Peale's old parish in New York City called the Marble Collegiate Church on Lower Fifth Avenue. I published a dozen or so books, maybe more than that, most of which I wrote during that period. I cared for my dear wife for about two years as, as she struggled with cancer and the chemotherapy. That was certainly not easy. And I buried her. Finally, through my attendance at something called a spouse loss group in a local spiritual care center, I met someone who had lost her beloved husband after more than 50 years, and I married her so that we had to combine our two households and adapt to some new ways of living. During all that time, I kept up with dozens of old friends and family members by phone and email and in person and learned to be part of a whole new family as my wife, Gloria, had three grown daughters and five granddaughters, all in a happy, active relationship, and most of them living with a short distance of our home. I continued to care for my health, which takes a lot more care when you get older than it was dead. And I published three books of letters to my grandchildren, which I have not yet given to them, but will do so once they leave home to go to college and their parents can't confiscate them. All of which is to say, if I need to point it out at all, that not seeing my grandchildren in all those years has not been the end of the world for me. That I wish I'd been able to have my grandchildren around me for love and support through the worst of those times, you bet I did. I really needed them, but I'm still here and they're still there still only half an hour away, and I hope that someday I'll get to be with them again and have a wonderful relationship that we should have been having all along. There will be great rejoicing if that ever happens, especially in this old man's heart. But meanwhile, there are many other things to consider for you as well as for me. First, there, there are our other friends and loved ones to care about. Most of us don't live in isolation from such a nexus of love and care. And it is a nexus in which we are as duty bound to care for them as they are to care about us. We can't just have our pain and enjoy it in private. We don't live in that kind of world. We aren't like the young woman in a cartoon I saw a few weeks ago. Like many of the young women you see these days, whether in a park or a restaurant or on the college campus, and this goes for the men too, she was fixated on her cell phone. 
And while she sat there staring at that little piece of technology, all kinds of things were going on around her. There was a hospital ward with doctors and nurses treating an overabundance of COVID-19 patients. There were people crowding around an airport, presumably in Kabul, Afghanistan, all of them trying to get on a plane that would carry them to freedom. There were homes being flooded by rising waters after a hurricane had passed and people desperately trying to get into boats or make their way to higher ground. There were poor beggars holding out their baking cups and, and there were other scenes in which people were trying to cope with all kinds of human situations, most of which seemed totally intractable. That cartoon spoke the truth, didn't it? We don't live our lives alone. We don't exist in isolation from other people in the world. We can't simply focus on ourselves and our hurts and pains and forget about the ills and sufferings of all of humankind around us. Sure, I feel awful about not getting to know my own grandchildren, not being able to see them and hug them and tell them stories and listen to their stories, not sharing my life and experience and love with the very people who are my own project, the offspring of my own seed, the bearers of my DNA, the future hope of my family's destiny. But I don't have the luxury of ignoring the rest of the world around me, all, all the friends and loved ones, all, all the complex society that goes on functioning, whether I choose to be part of it or not. Also, I can suck my thumb and weep to myself about how terrible my life is because I don't get to enjoy my own grandchildren. I can't shut out the world the way that young woman does who's staring at her cell phone and ignoring the hurting, wonderful, magnificent world around her. I'm part of that world too, and I have to go on living as part of it and not resign my membership in the human race because I have a finite hurt in the midst of an infinite pain, because I have a splinter in my finger as I stand in the death ward of the local hospital where I've come to visit other patients. There's a lot of work to be done. Our world is in great need, perhaps the greatest it has ever known. There are poor people to care for, there are students to teach, and hurts to heal, and passions to tame, and old folks to look after, and stories to tell, and gospels to preach, and people to rehabilitate. Of course, we hurt when our son or daughter won't let us be with our grandchildren something we've always considered a right. At some point in the chain of life, if we hadn't been there, neither would those children. But in a time like this, we can't stand on our rights and privileges. There are people to be helped on every side of us. If we don't see them, it's because we're so preoccupied with our own problems that we're not even looking at theirs. I live in a neighborhood of older folks, not as old as I am, I admit, but they're older than the people in most neighborhoods. One neighbor who lives in the house next door has had a broken metatarsal bone in his foot, and the doctor had to replace it with a metal rod. He hobbled around in a cast for several weeks, and now he's out of the cast and into some special shoes. The neighbor on the other side of him had a hip replacement that required metal braces being screwed into his thigh as well. So very painful. He's getting around better now. We saw him out mowing his yard on a riding mower. But he's going to be limited in his physical abilities for several weeks yet to come. I want to be there for these neighbors to run errands or take them to the doctor or do whatever I can to make their lives a little easier right now when, when they're having such a difficult time. I can moan and groan about not getting to see my grandchildren, but I have these other responsibilities now, and I mustn't let my worries about my grandchildren interfere with my being a good neighbor. 
The little church I belong to is part of a confederation of churches that are trying to help the Afghan people who had to flee from Afghanistan and whom our government has been settling in large groups around our base area of Washington, D.C. I live only 40 miles from Washington. One way we're helping is through a clothing collection for these displaced persons. Most of them came with only a suitcase or two, if at most. I need to go through my closet and take out some clothing that we, would be suitable for men in that group of exiles as the cooler weather approaches. My wife will do the same on her side of our closet. These folks arrived in our country a few days ago with, with at most one or two suitcases and some with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. They need our help more than at any other time of their lives. They need it now. Sure, I miss my grandkids. I'd love to see them, but I can't worry too much about myself and my family problem when I ought to be worried about these poor people who have left everything behind to come to a new country and start a new life. Do you understand me? Are you getting the picture? We have a lot to learn. I know I do at least. Our knowledge about everything in our world has doubled and tripled and quadrupled in the last few years. And it's expounding, expanding at the, at the greatest rate in the history of mankind. If you've had any chance to be around any of your grandchildren or any of your neighbor's children, you know what I mean. They're learning things in the third and fourth grades that weren't even being taught when you and I were in school. We can't know everything, of course, but we do need to learn all we can in order to be the best citizens we can be and in order to make as big a contribution to the world as we can possibly make. It's our duty. My problem now is my memory. It was pretty good when I was 80, and it wasn't even bad when I got to be 84 or 85, but since then, it's been going downhill as if it were on the back side of a roller coaster. I can learn something one day and forget it before nightfall. I'm sorry about it. I, I apologize to my wife a dozen times a day for having forgotten something I should have known and remembered. She's very gracious about it and doesn't rub it in by calling me an old fool, even, even though I know that's what I am. My doctor gave me a prescription for some pills called Donepazil. It's supposed to be a memory drug. I, I take it if I don't forget to. I, I think it's working. I, it, it makes me think about a lot of things from my boyhood that I'd forgotten to think about for years, but doesn't do a darn thing for the things I need to remember now, like the name of my paper boy or the street I'm supposed to turn down to get to my doctor's office or being sure to put gas in the car so we won't get stranded on the roadside. But I still want to learn things. I'm still teachable, even if I don't remember most things very well. I want to learn some of the remarkable things that are in books these days. My wife is reading a book written by Oprah Winfrey and a psychiatrist friend of, her, friend of hers called Dr. Perry. It's called what happened to you, I think. I read a few pages in it. Oprah starts it by remembering, remembering her childhood and how hard that childhood often was. She said she got whooped every day. Whooped was her word. She got whooped every day for something she did or something she should have done but failed to do. Her mother and her grandmother were both very hard on her. Dr. Perry, who writes in the book too, says this is what happened to her. And it's a lot more important to know that than what they did to her formative young, per and, and to know what it did to her formative young personality than it is to name any kind of syndrome or mental problem she might have now. If she knows that, she can figure out why she behaves the way she does now. She admits that these frequent beatings made her think she wasn't okay and caused her to work hard as a teenager and after her teenage years to be okay and 
and to be productive and creative in life. Has she ever been creative? I knew Oprah back then, not when she was a girl, but when she was a young apprentice working around the studios of Station WSM in Nashville, Tennessee. A man named Teddy Bart had a TV program then called The Noon Show. And because he thought religion was helpful to his viewers, he had a different minister in the studio each week to speak for 10 minutes during each of his programs. I forget how he and I first met, but when he learned that I was a minister and was teaching at Vanderbilt Divinity School, only a few miles from the WSM studios, he often called on me to fill in for pastors who suddenly got a sore throat or had something else to unexpectedly interfere with their being there for their assigned duty. It was during the noon show that I first met Oprah and saw her moving industriously around the studio doing whatever chores she had been assigned to do. Pat Sajak, who for years has been the amiable host of the Wheel of Fortune program for ABC TV, was another young ingenue around that studio in those days. Two of the most famous people I know, and I met them when they were both tadpoles just learning to swim in the big fish tank of life, and I was a substitute preacher on Teddy Bark's program. Sorry, I got off the track there, didn't I? I told you I'm very forgetful now. I'm not even sure how to get back to what we were talking about when I went off the rails. Oh, yes, it was talking about, I was talking about how much there is to learn, and how we ought to be busy at that instead of moaning and groaning that we can't be visiting with our grandchildren. There isn't just a, a lot to learn in the world we live in. There's a lot to enjoy, isn't there? Have you ever thought about that? That if you're all wrapped up in grieving about not, about not getting to be with your grandchildren, you're probably forgetting to enjoy the beauty and vastness and glory of this big, wonderful world we live in. I hate it when I get distracted and forget to enjoy my life from day to day. God didn't put us here to be knots on a log or spots on the carpet. He, he put us here to live, to absorb and enjoy the world, to, to be as present to everything as we possibly can. I'm failing my mission as a human being when I allow myself to worry about how much I'm missing, like my grandkids, instead of capitalizing on what I do have access to, all of the beauties and mysteries and joys of the world at large. My wife, Gloria, helps me to see and enjoy the world of birds and animals. She's loved these creatures all her life, I think. Since we combined our households a few years ago, she has erected half a dozen bird feeding stands in our yard and hanging from a big redbud tree that grows just off our back deck. It's a rare day when there aren't 20 or 30 birds of all kinds flocking to those feeders or building nests in some of the birdhouses she also put up. I used to notice the birds occasionally, but now I see them pay attention to them every day. There, there's still many things to admire and enjoy in the world around us. In spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, the restrictions that has put upon our travel and participating in big, big public events. I used to love going to the theater. When I lived in New York and London years ago, I saw most of the great dramas staged in those cities. Now, I have to content myself with some wonderful dramas that come to us through the TV set. In some ways, it isn't as intimate a thing as going to a real theater. But in other ways, it is even more intimate because it's happening right there in our family den. And there are magnificent programs about the world we live in, like the one we watched recently called, I think it was called When Wheels Walked an instructive film about the dinosaurs that once roamed our land. And the evidence that the paleontologists, the 
earth scientists now have, that the birds that fly around us today, the birds actually evolved originally from some of those dinosaurs. I know that's hard to believe, but the proof is convincing that this is true. When some of the dinosaurs developed breast bones, these gradually somehow evolved into wings. First, there were flying dinosaurs. And eventually, as smaller and smaller species emerged, they subdivided into the incredibly numerous families of birds that exist in our world today. Now, this is only one example. I could give you dozens of them about the various programs we've seen that have opened up all kinds of mysteries in the way our present world has developed. There's almost no end to the many things yet to be discovered about how, about how the things that are came to be what they are. If we only have a little imagination, we can gain a bigger and bigger sense of the wonders that surround us from birth to death. This is why we must let our preoccupation with whatever troubles we're having with our children and grandchildren consume our attention as if they were the only thing left to us. They aren't. We just have to reset our focus of attention, enlarge our field of vision until we feel almost overwhelmed by the magic and mystery of existence as a whole. If we don't, if we let our problems with getting to see and spend time with our grandchildren become the central thing in our lives, we become like that young woman I spoke of earlier whose field of vision had shrunk to her tiny little cell phone while all the great activi activities of the world in our times swirled around her like magic shadows in the air. I know it isn't easy, but somehow we, we have to tear ourselves away from our family problems long enough to have a proper vision of the real size and the entrancing features of the incredibly extensive universe we inhabit. You can draw up your own list of all the things we should be recalling and living with every day. The important thing is not to become so fixated with your personal problem that it's the primary thing in your world and you lose your sense of participation in life itself and the vast array of beautiful experiences awaiting us in the larger world. You have to learn, as I do, not to fixate on what we don't have, but to give thanks for all the wonderful things we do have. I know more than one family whose attention and sense of what's important in their lives has shrunk their sensitivity and concentration on it from what it would normally be to a mere sliver of its own former self. It doesn't matter what's happening around them or who has come to see them or what the news is on television or anything else. They just aren't open to dealing with anything, but they're all consuming family problem. There were times when I realized this was happening to my wife and me, but thank God we were rescued from that myopic position and could measure how truly small it was, infinitesimal even, in comparison with the things that were happening in the greater world and the beauty and majestic scope of the world itself. It's not easy. I understand it if you tell me you cry all the time for those beautiful grandbabies you aren't allowed to enjoy in your home. Or if you're so preoccupied by the way you're being treated by your child and his or her spouse that you can no longer see the beauty of it and the glory of the greater world in which we live. But I hope, I really hope that you are trying to combat this tendency to dwell all the time on the injustice of your situation and can actually see it for the minute and bearable thing it is 
in the greater expanse of life in our universe. Let me give you another illustration of what I'm talking about. My wife and I live in a lovely suburban neighborhood on the edge of a small town, as I said, about 40 miles southwest of the nation's capital. It's a beautifully kept neighborhood of about 40 homes. Everyone seems to take pride in how his or her property looks. The expansive lawns are mown regularly. And the roads and the driveways are clean when there's snow on them. There's a mixture of people in our neighborhood. Some, some are retired and some are still working. Several are employed by the government, work in D.C. I think we have three or four CIA members among them. Our immediate neighbors across the street have two daughters and three grandchildren, and the grandmother spends most of her days at one of her daughter's home, minding the two children while the mother works. Beside our home reside a young couple and their three little girls who have to be among the cutest kids in the world. One of them is 10 and one is eight and one is four. The father is an IT expert and since the coming of this pandemic, he's been working most, most of the time from home. Both parents are athletic. I sometimes see them racing one another across their backyard with the little girls looking on in amazement at their parents in motion. The children, the girls are all enthralled, enthralled by our little white multi-poo dog, whose name is Toby. And when I'm walking Toby past their house, they always run out squealing for us to pause in our walk while they fall over, all over Toby and nuzzle him as if he were the most delightful, curliest haired little dog in the world. Now, if I were totally hung up over my own four grandchildren that live half, a while, half an hour away and whom I never see, I could not enjoy those neighbor children at all. They would only remind me of what I'm missing with my own offspring. But I try not to let that be the case. I want to enjoy them for who they are and laugh at their antics and converse with them as if I understood everything they say and have a fitting response for it. I don't always. Recently, when my wife and I were sitting with Toby on our front porch, all, all three of the girls came running up to visit with us and take their turns at snuggling little Toby. It was a, a beautiful, warm occasion. My, my heart simply soared as we visited. I'm grateful that while I miss my own grandchildren terribly, I have not become so absorbed by the failure in my own family system that I cannot appreciate those lovely little girls and their interplay with us and our dog. They fill me with joy and satisfaction. They don't completely take the place of my own grandchildren, but they help to remind me that the world is a lot bigger than my personal problem with my son and his wife and the fact that I can't be with my own flesh and blood. You understand what I'm saying? Of course, you're hurt that you can't enjoy your grandchildren. That's natural. Shame on your children for letting things be that way. It really is grandparent abuse as some have called it. And what the children are missing is grandchild abuse because those grandchildren are missing out under one, out on all the wonderful things they'd be getting from you. But that's the way things are. And as far as we can tell, they're gonna stay that way. There's not a whole lot we can do in most cases to change things. It's a matter of context, of seeing things in their proper perspective. Someday, hopefully, your grandchildren will grow up and seek you out, wanting to know their own heritage more accurately than their parents have probably reported to them. In my case, that's one reason I've published three books of letters to my grandchildren and plan to see that each of them gets a set of the books after they've grown up and left home. 
my first grandchild uh, was in our home a lot since she was two years old and the mother decided it was time to stop this uh, this movement back and forth with their grand with the grandchild and she uh, called me Poppy that was her name for me so I entitled these three books uh, from Poppy with Love Letters from a Grandfather to the grandchildren he isn't allowed to see. I wrote them back several years ago when my wife Anne was still alive because I wanted these grandchildren someday to know how much their father's parents really cared about them, even from a distance. And perhaps if they get them someday and read them, it will motivate them to get in touch with me wherever they are providing I'm still in the realm of the living. At any rate, it will help to fill in the blank spaces in their lives so that they can live with more self-understanding than they would without the books. Meanwhile, I'm trying to go on with my life in its broader context. I know I'm missing a lot, not having them in my life, but at least, I'm trying as bravely as possible to go on with my work and my network of friends and my appreciation of the wider world I inhabit. You can do the same. You just have to resolve to get beyond the impasse your child and his or her spouse have thrust you into by fencing off your grandkids so you don't get to enjoy them and they don't get to profit from knowing you. The secret to doing this is to live your life as fully as possible in all other respects. You have to rise above the hurt and loneliness you've been cast into and actually live as if those kids didn't even exist. In the end, it's the only way I know to handle this difficult and unpleasant situation. I don't know if we'll know our grandchildren in the next life or if they'll know us, but even if we don't get together there, you'll have lived your life as well as you could under the circumstances. I find after a few years of practice that I can go whole days without even thinking about my grandchildren even I know that they and their parents drive within a couple of miles of our home almost every weekend that they spend at their lake house several miles on the other side of this town. I've learned not even to think about that anymore. I take it back. I, I do think about one of the grandchildren every day. It's the oldest of them, Ellie, who has been diagnosed with lupus. Ellie's 17 years old now. I last saw her when she was two years old. I pray for Ellie faithfully every night before I go to sleep. and ask that God will make her pain as minimal as possible and let her develop as normally as she can under the circumstances. I wish I could see her on a regular basis in order to encourage her and to help her to rise above her disease as much as possible. I want to hold her and tell her stories and encourage her to think positively in spite of the ravages of the awful disease. But I know I can't do that and I don't let my mind go there. I just pray for her and leave it at that. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Throughout history, families were always family. Well, sometimes there were young rebels in the family who would leave home at an early age, not be heard again. But there was an almost guaranteed interdependence of family members in the old days. They needed one another in order to survive and to enjoy their lives. It's only in the last half century, I believe, that things have changed so radically in our world and that interdependence has simply gone away or been deemed unnecessary. It's only in the last 20 or 30 years that we've become aware of how common this split in the family has become. 
and how many other grandparents suffer as we do because that wonderful togetherness has become endangered. We're tough, though. Did you know that? We're tough. And we're more resilient than most of us really know that we are. We can survive this hurt and pain and come out on the other side of it with lives that are still full and meaningful, even without those precious grandchildren. So take heart, my friends. There are a lot of us in this boat that can actually make it to the other shore without those lovely kids. It isn't what we wanted, and we certainly didn't plan on it, but we can survive it and still have beautiful lives. I challenge you, and I promise to pray for you, even though we've never met and had a proper introduction. I believe in prayer, and I hope you do. I hope my prayers will be supportive of you and your loved ones through all the years of your lives, whether you ever meet those beloved children in your whole earthly existence or not. God, give us peace and courage and strength. And God, give us love in spite of the burdens we're forced to live with. Remember, those burdens may make us stronger and better people as we bear them through the years. That's the prayer I want to pray for you. Thanks for listening to this old man. God bless you.